sisters, professionals, educators, leaders, and activists, we often put others before we put ourselves. Our children, our families, our partners, our bosses, our colleagues, the people we serve, and the people we stand up for. Today, we've taken the time to stand up for ourselves and feed ourselves. So thank you for bringing us together to do that, Skinless and Maria and all of today's volunteers. And with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Jackie Ruiz, author, CEO of JJR Marketing, who will be speaking about reaching your dreams, living out every aspect of her life. Born in Mexico City, Jacqueline Camacho Ruiz moved to the United States at age 14, where she learned English in just one year. Hungry for knowledge, Jacqueline earned her college degree and became trilingual. From a very early age, Jackie devoured lit amazing literature from authors like Dale Carnegie, Zig Ziglar, Napoleon Hill, and other business icons who influenced the launch of her award-winning JJR Marketing Consultants Agency in 2006. A true PR star, Jacqueline's iPhone tells the story. There resides dozens of phone numbers for top national media personalities, radio television producers, and social media celebrities. She's a regular guest on TV and radio, including CBS World News, CBS Chicago, WGN TV, ABC 7 News, WGN Radio 720. Jacqueline speaks to hundreds of audiences nationwide and is described as having a fire about marketing and about life that leaps off the stage. Jacqueline earned the Emerging Leader Award by the Chicago Association of Direct Marketing, the Entrepreneurial Excellence and Influential Women in Business Awards by Daily Herald, the Business Ledger, and was a finalist for Latina Entrepreneur of the Year by the Ch Chicago Latino Network, Highest Human Relations Award by Dale Carnegie, amongst others. She serves on the board of Junior Achievement Western Region, Community Contacts, and the Publicity Club of Chicago. As a two-time cancer survivor, Jacqueline possesses wisdom about her life well beyond her years. She lives in the Midwest with her husband and business partner, Juan Pablo, and her two children, Leonardo and Juliana. And with that, Jacqueline. I'd like for you to stand up, please. And I want everyone close to the stage. We have plenty of room here. We have plenty of room here. Let's come together, togetherness, like Shivani was talking about earlier. Let's just come together. And actually, the, the two people that come to the front the soonest up into this area, if, if you're in the back, I'll give you a copy of my book. <laughs> See, that's what I'm talking about. Come on, everyone, let's just get closer. There's no reason for you to be all the way back. There's plenty of seats here. You can move my, bring your chairs up. Let's, let's, um, let's come together. Give you a minute. Everything you ever wanted is on the other side of fear. Everything you ever wanted is on the other side of fear. I was born in the largest city in the world to two entrepreneurial parents. I was the youngest out of three children. And by mistake or destiny, I was always exposed to incredible literature. I didn't know that that literature was going to change my life. And what was fascinating is that I used to see my parents create things from nothing. I used to see my mom go out and show some products and come back and win trips and all kinds of stuff. And it was never easy. I remember being uh, you know, from a middle class family. I never had all the latest in technology. In fact, I had it, but maybe three years later, which meant that it wasn't technology anymore. And uh, one particular morning, I got up and I noticed in this polluted city, which is the city of Mexico, I noticed that there were all these figs hanging from a tree. And that particular morning, those figs looked completely different than they ever had looked before. All of a sudden, I saw opportunities in those figs. And, and you have to consider that 
in Mexico, since it's overpopulated, they were, the backyards and patios were almost non-existent for many, many families. And uh, the fact that we even had a yard, I mean, a little patio in the back, you know, it's just amazing. But that morning, I, I saw those figs and I said, I bet you I could do something with them. Got up and I climbed and I got as many as I could. Went outside and I set up my little shop. I was determined to start my own business, selling figs. What was fascinating is that for about an hour, nobody would even notice that I was there. People were just passing by, they were wearing their business suits and they were in a hurry because they had, to, they had to do something, right? They had to go to their work. And my dream had always been to wear a suit. So I was always intrigued by all these people running around wearing suits. Now my dream is different, but <laughs> I'll tell you about that later. Um, so I remember for about half an hour, an hour, I was just sitting there and nobody would even notice that I was there. Then my experience reading those amazing books and seeing my parents started to kick in, I said, well, wait a second. This is not what my mom does. She doesn't sit on the silence and wait for people to do something. So I started getting up from my chair and I started chasing people down the street. <laughs> now, as I chased them, I said, I was not asking for them to buy one fig. I mean, you don't want one fig, you want multiple figs. Because now you have people to, to make a difference for, right? You have your friends and family that you might want to bring a fig to. So I would sell one, two, three, four, five as they were coming back to my, to my stand. The funny thing is that by, my, by the time my mom noticed, I had sold about 30 pesos in figs, which was quite a feat for a, for a little girl. And to be honest with you, I didn't even remember how old I was. I just remember the experience vaguely in my mind and how it has applied in my life uh, and all the challenges that I faced. And she reminded me uh, just a few weeks ago that I was in kindergarten. So I was about five years old when I was selling the figs. And now, why does this story, why does that story have to do with anything here? Well, I gotta tell you that from my short 29 years in this world, it has everything to do with the story. So I'll, I'll tell you one of the first challenges that I faced, and I didn't know that that little story was gonna impact my life. And the first thing that, I, that happened to me is that we went from a big city, from the biggest city in the world, to what seemed the smallest town in the world. <laughs> and you can imagine the, the dynamics. I mean, you're in the city, nobody cares what you wear, where you go, or how you look like, right? Because everybody's in their own world. In, in a little town with 6,000 people, you better believe that people care. And they care about where you go, where time you're coming back, and they, there's sort of this jealousy, you know, there's sort of this jealousy going around. So you can imagine the shock that I had as a little girl from looking at the world and seeing the possibilities of the big city to coming to a really tiny town and, and wondering am I, how we're even going to make it in this little town. And one, ta one time I was actually playing in the downtown area of uh, this little town and uh, people started screaming just, you know, just very loudly and saying, fire, fire. And they not only screamed, they were coming up to me and saying that that was my house. My house happened to be in the, big, in the, in the tallest point of town. So you could see this massive fire just you know, from, the, from the ground area. You could see this huge fire. And when people started telling me that was my house, I mean, my heart, I was about 11 years old and my heart went down to my feet and just thinking, Somebody there? Is my dad there? Is he sleeping? Because it was, it was in the evening. You know, I started thinking about my toys. I started thinking about all these things. But when we got to the scene, and there's no firefighters in Mexico. I mean, there's, especially in this little town. So people were coming with buckets of water and just trying to seize the fire. And the only thing I kept thinking about is like, okay, my toys. How are my toys doing? What can I, I don't want my toys to be burned. But what I got inside, it was almost like, um, you know, houses are not made out of, like, you know, what we, made out, like wood and stuff. They're more made out of brick. So it really became a hot oven. And everything inside with the heat just melted. I mean, just, it was crazy. But hours later, as I got in the house and I noticed we had a huge shelf of books, probably about 10 feet long. And these are the books that I'd read as a little girl. These are the books that I became so passionate about, the books that changed my life. And all of a sudden, 70%, 80% of those were gone. And I remember that exact moment amidst the, you know, the 
still gives me, you know, because it was a very, um, very dramatic experience for a little girl. And I remember just sitting there and thinking, number one, why did this happen? Number two, why, why are my books burnt? I mean, these are the books that I became in love with. These are the books that taught me the value of relationships and the value of making others feel important. These, are, these were my babysitters. You know, that's how I see them. These are my babysitters. And, uh, and for the first time in my life, I realized that once you learn something, nobody can take it away from you. Once you learn something, once somebody shares something with you, once you read it, hear it, or experience something, no one has the ability nor the talent to take it away from you. And that became really powerful. So the theory became life. Because I knew that I couldn't go back and rely to those books anymore, that I would perhaps have new books, but those books that changed my life, I would not be able to see them again. So I became on a quest and I, be, I wanted to be the best I can be every day. I just wanted to explore and I wanted to make sure that I became the best at applying those principles of relationships and making others feel important in life. What I didn't know is that I was going to be challenged over and over again and that I was going to apply those principles like I had never thought about applying them before and really making those things come to life. And when I was 14, we again go through another transition. We come to the United States. Now, mind you that I took some private classes in Mexico, but I never really paid attention. I never thought we were actually going to live here. I had no idea. I mean, I just, I, I, I preferred, you know, playing with my friends and learning English. So when I came here, I didn't speak a word of English. The things that I know how to say were mispronounced because I guess the teacher sucked. <laughs> he didn't really give us a good instruction. So, so imagine I come here, I'm 14 years old. I'm trying to figure out who I am as a person. I mean, you know, in my teenage years. And I didn't speak a word of English. I get to high school and they say, well, you know what? It's going to take you three years to learn. Go through the English as a second language course. Is anybody familiar with that, ESL? And then once you go through that, when you're a senior in high school, you'll have the opportunity to go to the mainstream classes, right? You know, when the teachers share that with me, there's something that just didn't quite sink in with me. <laughs> like, so let me see. You're asking me to wait four years so that I can effectively communicate and be normal and share my dreams, all the dreams that I've had since I was a little girl? Is that what you're asking me to do? That equation just didn't sink in with me. So I, I took matters in my own hands and I, despite you know, what everybody else was saying, I started reading in the back of shampoos. I started reading billboards. I started reading um, signs and saying, you know what, if I were to take that word away, would it take away the essence of what I'm trying to say? And if the answer were yes, I said, I need to know this word. And I knew that in English, unlike Spanish or German or you know, any other language, that you had to learn how to say it, how to write it, what it means, and how to use it. So I said, well, I got to start somewhere. So I started writing down all the words and just writing them down in a little notebook that I you know, made up myself. And the next day, I would come to my teacher and say, how do you use this word? What does it mean? How, how, can I, how can I say it? And she told me that, and immediately I started using the word. So through this awareness of getting the foundation of this language in place and then plugging in words, I knew that I was going to be able to make paragraphs and even books and conversations, and I just needed to plug in verbs and words and plug them in and out. So it became a puzzle. How many times in life are we just puzzled by something that society puts on us and say, oh my gosh, a language? Are you kidding me? That's the hardest thing. Immediately, before we even give it a try, before we even have a chance to find out if it's for us or not, if we have the ability to do that, which every single one of us do, we, you know, we just basically give up, right? Because of what society tells us. So the moment that I started shifting to saying, you know what, it's not a language, it's a puzzle. It, become, it, it became so much easier than it had ever been before. And all of a sudden, the words started plugging in, and I could see, you know, fluid, you know, the, the, the words and the thoughts just coming into place and, and creating sentences like conversations. And one morning, I woke up in the morning, I said,